Hello everyone, welcome to Network Engineer Pro. My name is Raphael, and in this video, we are gonna talk about ARP, which is the Address Resolution Protocol. This is gonna be a two-part video. This is part one, where we're gonna talk about the theory. Now, in part two, we're gonna be looking at the ARP table on the CLI of a Cisco router, some of the configuration options available to us, as well as analyzing ARP messages inside of a packet capture with Wireshark. Let's get right to it. Now, ARP is used to find out the layer two MAC address and associate it with an IP. We need this because data is encapsulated inside of ethernet frames and the ethernet frames have a source and destination MAC address. We need a destination MAC address to properly send data on the LAN. Now, that information or IP to MAC binding is stored inside something called an ARP table or an ARP cache inside of devices like routers and PCs so that it can be referenced when building ethernet frames and sending data. By default, Cisco routers store ARP entries in their ARP table for four hours. But like most things, that value can be changed. When it comes to ARP, there are two messages. We have the ARP request and the ARP reply. Now, the ARP request is a broadcast message that gets blasted on the LAN and basically says, hey, whoever has IP 1.1.1.1, please give me your MAC address. The ARP reply is when the device in question says, hey, yeah, I have that IP configured. Here is the MAC address info you requested. Now that you have the MAC address, you can add it to your ARP cache. Now what's great is that it's cached for a certain amount of time, so you can just reference that instead of having to repeat the whole ARP process over again. Now let's look at a diagram and go through the process in more detail. All right, so here's a topology. We have a pretty simple setup. We have two computers in the same subnet. We have PC1 on the left with IP 1.1.1.1 and a MAC address of all A's. PC2 on the right has IP 1.1.1.2 and a MAC address of all B's. So PC1 wants to send data over to PC2. So we know that it's going to take the data and it's going to put an IPv4 header on it. The source IP inside the IPv4 header is going to be the IP of PC1. So 1.1.1.1. The destination IP is going to be the IP of PC2, which is 1.1.1.2. We're going to take that IP header in the data and we're going to put it inside of an Ethernet frame. So the source MAC address on the Ethernet frame is going to be the MAC address of PC1. The destination MAC address should be the MAC address of PC2, but at this point, PC1 does not know about it. So you see these two PCs here, they have ARP tables or ARP caches. So let's say this is a Windows machine and you were to log on to PC1 and open the command prompt and you type ARP dash A. That's gonna give you a list of all the ARP entries for that computer. So what you would hopefully see is an entry for PC2 that looks like this. 1.1.1.2 maps to a MAC address of BBB, B, B, so all Bs. If this was the case, it would look at its ARP cache and see that, hey, it does know about the MAC address for PC2. It's going to populate the destination MAC address field with the MAC address of PC2. But again, it doesn't know about it, so we need to ARP for it. So PC1 is going to send out a broadcast message on the LAN, basically saying, hey, whoever has IP 1.1.1.2, could you pretty please give me your MAC address because I really need it. PC2 would get that message and then in turn send an ARP reply back towards PC1 saying, yeah, here you go. I have IP 1.1.1.2. Here's the MAC address info you requested. Great. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So now we're back on PC1. PC1 is going to go ahead and send out its ARP request. Now remember, this message is a broadcast message. It goes out to everyone on the LAN. So the destination MAC address for this message is gonna be all Fs. So if you had another PC here, like PC3, PC3 would get the broadcast as well, but realize that it's not for him and drop it. Now inside of the actual ARP request, there's four important fields. We have the sender MAC, we have the sender IP, we have the target MAC, and the target IP. Now, 
inside the sender Mac field, you're going to have the Mac address of PC one, because he's the one that sent the ARP request in the first place. So a, 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 the sender IP is going to be the IP of PC one, which in our case is all one. So 1.1.1.1. One 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 one. The target Mac address, this value is going to be all zeros because we don't know it. The target IP is going to be the IP of PC2, so 1.1.1.2. So PC2 received the ARP request and said, hey, I'm 1.1.1.2. Here is the MAC address info you requested. Now it does this in a different message called the ARP reply. So that's going in this direction. Now this message is not going to be a broadcast message. This message is going to be directly to PC1, so the destination in source MAC address info, that's going to change. The source MAC is going to be the MAC of PC2, which is B, 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 B. And the destination MAC address is going to be the MAC address of PC1, which is all A's. Now we still have these four fields inside the ARP reply, but some of the values change a little bit. Actually, they all do. The sender MAC address is going to be the MAC address of PC2, which is all B's. The sender IP is going to be the IP of PC2, which is 1.1.1.2. The target MAC address, remember this one was all zeros inside of the ARP request. It's not all zeros anymore. The target MAC address is going to be the MAC address of PC1, so all A's. The target IP is going to be the IP of PC1, 1.1.1.1. Now as soon as PC1 gets this ARP reply, it's going to populate its ARP cache. Remember this thing we talked about here? So when it looked when it when you do an ARP dash A, you're gonna see 1.1.1.2 maps to B B B B. Now we have a valid ARP entry, so we can finish building the Ethernet frame that we were trying to build in the first place. So the source MAC is gonna be A A A all A's. The destination MAC address is gonna be the MAC address of PC2 all B's. Now during this process. PC2 also populated its ARP cache. So when PC2 does an ARP dash A, it's going to have an ARP entry that looks like this 1.1.1.1. Maps to MAC address all A's. And that's a detailed overview of how the ARP process works. All right, so now that everyone knows each other's MAC address, we can finish sending the data without any issues. Remember, we needed this because we take that data, we take that IP header, and we encapsulate them inside of Ethernet frames. And Ethernet frames use source and destination MAC addresses. All right, so that's basic ARP theory for part one of this video. In the next video, we're going to look at the CLI of a Cisco router, look at its ARP cache, as well as some of the configuration options related to it, along with packet capture so that we can understand the details of the request and reply messages. And there are other flavors of ARP like gratuitous ARP and proxy ARP, but we'll save those for another time. All right, I hope you all enjoyed this video and learned something. If you did, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Also, I'm going to be releasing a lot more content in the future like more videos, webinars, free courses, protocol cheat sheets, and more. So if you want to stay up to date and be a part of that, go to NetworkEngineerPro.com, which I put a link in the description of the video. Click get notified so you can get the newsletter and be the first to know what I'm working on and when it comes out. Thanks everyone and I'll see you in the next video.